Hello, this is Kerry Schutz from MathWorks. And in this video, I'm going to show how to get the impulse response from time domain measurements. The use case we'll be looking at is a PAM3 based system. There are many ways to approach this problem. The classic way would be to estimate the transfer function and then convert that to its corresponding impulse response. And that's actually what we're going to be showing today. Uh, there are other approaches here that I list two, three, four, five, where we just compute the cross correlation. That's a simple way, use a simple ratio of FFTs use functionality from the system identification toolbox or use an adaptive algorithm like the LMS um, to do the same thing of, of uh, estimating or measuring the impulse response of a system. I'm gonna be concentrating on technique number one today. Well, I'm gonna be using a Simulink model for impulse response uh, computation. Um, we're gonna excite our device under test, which just so happens to model a lossy channel with reflections. We're modeling that using a FIR filter block in Simulink. Uh, the response to that channel is then fed into a transfer function estimator. And from knowing the excitation, knowing their response, um, all in the time domain, we're going to convert that uh, to a transfer function. And then we're going to take that transfer function, extract the impulse response. So there's kind of a two-step process, transfer function estimation, impulse response extraction. Uh, for the transfer function estimation, uh, we're going to be leveraging uh, functionality from the DSP system toolbox. Again, there's functionality within there to estimate the auto spectrum and the cross spectrum. And if you compute those two things individually, you can take the ratio and from the ratio, you get the transfer function estimate. And uh, what I'm showing down at the bottom of the slide is basically a block diagram form of the same thing. Uh, the MATLAB code section, of course, is all in MATLAB or system object code. And then I'm just giving you a more perhaps intuitive feel for how that code works under the hood by giving you a block diagram of where you uh, window it in the time domain, take the FFT. Uh, we're doing single sided. We're going to compute the auto spectrum on top. We're going to compute the cross spectrum on bottom. And then we're going to uh, spectrally average those two individual signals take their ratio, that's what we're calling H here, H in the text code. They're gonna separate that into the magnitude and phase and then display it on the spectrum analyzer. So that's the first part of the entire impulse response extraction approach is get this transfer function estimate H. Once we have H, we're gonna feed that into the impulse response conversion block, which is gonna do a number of just basic operations like flipping the vector because we have to form the, um, the negative side of the of the of the spectrum to do the impulse response extraction. So then we're going to start with the positive half of the spectrum here. We're going to flip it. We're going to just kind of prune off DC and Nyquist. We're going to conjugate, and then we're going to concatenate the positive uh, spectral components, frequency components, with the negative frequency components. That's going to form the overall complex frequency uh, vector. And then we're going to inverse FFT it and voila, out comes our impulse response, which is what you see at the bottom right hand corner uh, of the slide. So you actually, in this case, you see the impulse response derived in blue with the original impulse response. Of course, we know since we created the experiment to begin with in red, overlaid them to show how well they match. OK, so that's really it for the slide. So let's jump into um, the actual tools and show how this all worked uh, in the tools. So let's start with um, the system under test. And that would be this uh, model example right here where I've got two particular choices for the excitation. I've got the PAM3 signal, which has been pre-generated in MATLAB. And then I have brought that in as a signal from workspace uh, block. So it's imported data into Simulink that was generated in MATLAB. And then there's also just a random source block. If I wanted to, if I let's say I had access to random noise in the actual system, then I might use this block to excite the lossy channel. In this case, I'm assuming that my actual system doesn't have the ability to generate random noise, so I'm going to use the actual signal in this in the system to excite the system, which is PAM3 in nature, three level. So I'm going to excite the system. I'm going to look at the excitation. I'm going to look at the response in the time domain. I'm going to do the same thing with the out with the output of the system. Look at it in time and frequency domain. Let's go ahead and run it. And I'll put up the scope as well on top. And I'll stop it. 
and now we'll get a feel for how this looks. Um, let's just I'll go to another point of the waveform. Let's just go in here somewhere. And there, we'll just say maybe right in here. And then also we can stretch that out a little bit. We can do the same thing with the spectrum analyzer. Uh, again, input is in yellow, output is in blue on both time and frequency. If you look uh, kind of discernedly close, you can see that there is a correspondence between the input bit or level here and the corresponding output waveform here. You see that's just a delayed version of the other with, of course, some amount of filtering attached to it. Uh, and you could find that in other parts of the waveform here. This pulse here corresponds to this pulse here. This flat section here corresponds to this flat section here, etc. cetera. Uh, and then, of course, the spectrum. You see the characteristic shape of the PAM3 signal in yellow. That's the input, PAM3 signal input. And then the modified or filtered PAM3 signal on the output. You see these little spikes uh, kind of along the way along on the homes. And we're going to see these little spikes as we look at the transfer function of the system later. So the only thing this model did was it served to uh, just show how the system behaved roughly in the time and frequency domain. No, nothing precise in terms of transfer function or impulse response. There's also a preload function or script associated with this model, which uh, created the wave in and the digital filter uh, impulse response uh, coefficients. So let's just go ahead and take a look at it. If I open it up, you're going to see, first thing I do is I create the device under Tesla lossy channel. Uh, it's got a symbol, uh, symbol time of this 180 picoseconds corresponds to about 5.5 uh, giga symbols per second. And because it's PAM3, you get more than that bits per second. You get a 1.5 boost there on bits per second. When we're, sim when we're simulating this, we're going to oversample it by 16 samples per symbol. Uh, that's going to give us a particular uh, sample rate. And then we're going to model the channel. Uh, I'm going to leverage Certi's toolbox to generate this impulse response. But of course, you could use any impulse response uh, that modeled your channel. In this case, I just chose Certi's toolbox and it had a convenient function for doing that, where I could specify the channel loss. And then it comes up with an impulse response. Now, again, in this case, I actually know the impulse response since I'm creating the experiment. And I could go over to MATLAB and plot that out. Let me just bring up my MATLAB window. And I could say figure plot impulse zero. Grid on. And that's what it looks like in shape. Of course, we don't necessarily, I, I, just, I just did time index on bottom. If I wanted to look at it in terms of the uh, time vector, we could always create a time vector. I'll just call it T1, and that's going to be equal to, uh, I'll start from zero, and we're going to have a time step of TS as noted in the script. And it's a thousand, I know two, three long, so I'm going to do one less times TS for the time vector. That's just how long the impulse response is. Say figure plot T1, comma, impulse zero, grid on. And now we'll get a feel for the delay in the channel. If we now we can look at this and say this is on the nanosecond scale on bottom. So that would be about 0.25 nanoseconds of delay before the main bang hits in the uh, channel. Okay, so now let's move along. The next thing I do is I actually estimate that in a different way. I just get the max of it, we'll evaluate that. It says the delay IDX0 is about 23 samples. And if we take that times TS, we get about 250 something picoseconds, like we estimated from our um, simple uh, impulse response. We could also kind of get that same number by just cursoring our scope. So for instance, if we were saying uh, this edge of the signal here corresponds to this waveform here in blue, we could always put on our cursor measurements uh, here. It's going to bring two cursors in. I'm going to move those cursors. I'll, first thing I'll do is I'll zoom in on the bit or symbol of interest. And I'll say, let's put this cursor maybe right on that edge. And now let's take my other cursor and let's put it in the middle of that edge right in there. And if you look at the delta T, it's about 270 picoseconds. So I don't have it precise, of course, but that's roughly 
uh, the time we're talking about delay in the system. Okay, uh, crudely speaking. All right, and then the other thing I do is I create the stimulus waveform in this script. And what I do there is I leverage the rand i uh, function in MATLAB to generate random integers with a certain number of modulation levels, in this case, three. And that's pretty much it. Now, of course, that's going to generate like zero ones and twos or one, two, threes. Um, I'm going to ultimately want to scale that to be voltages. So I want to go between, in this case, you can see it's plus 0.5, zero, and minus 0.5. So down here, you're going to see where wave in has a minus one divided by two associated with it to create this kind of uh, uh, symmetric around zero volts or zero volt DC, uh, zero mean signal. Okay, so I create my wave in there in MATLAB and wave in then serves as the excitation for this block. Okay, so that's our quick and dirty model. Let's go over to now our transfer function estimation model. I'll call that up. Do I already have it open? Let's see, I, I do. Let's bring it on to this screen. Uh, in this model, I am going to now leverage this transfer function estimator block. It is also generating that same wave in waveform excitation. Instead of not the random noise, it's going to generate along this path into the device under test. The response from the device under test will feed now this response input. That will both both those signals now feed the transfer function estimator. If we go underneath the transfer function estimator it feeds a, a block which is doing some buffering and then where the heart of the uh, work that where all the work is done is under this tfe block if we go underneath it what we're going to find as well there's settings on it for like number of spectral averages and fft length and handing window etc but what's really notable here is there's a source code hyperlink if you go into the source code you can actually see how the block works you can set breakpoints etc if i were to uh, you can also take these shortcuts to particular functions within the system object, for instance, step IMPL or step implementation. If you go there, it's going to show you under the step IMPL function, it's going to say it's going to be calling this function here underneath dsp.transfer function estimator. You can open up that. When you go into that, you can do the same thing. You can go to the step IMPL under it, and it's going to show you that code that I had in the, in the PowerPoint slide earlier where it computes the auto spectrum, the cross spectrum, and then takes the ratio of them to compute the frequency response. And of course, you could set breakpoints on any of these codes and step into it and see how it, you know, computes windows and FFTs and does averaging and all that good, you know, tedious spectrum analysis stuff. Okay, so we won't go into that, but I will mention before I move on, there is, I did do a video on this topic, I'll pull it over here, uh, called the cross spectrum transfer function measurement. And it has, you know, all the gory details in it on how this uh, technique works without using a system object. It's all laid out in basic signal flow with buffering and sampling and windowing and FFT and uh, averaging and so on. And then finally to the magnitude and phase response. So if you want all the details on how that works, um, you know, and why it works the way it does, you know, how well it works, just look up that video called cross spectrum based transfer function measurement it's on the MATLAB channel. Uh, you can find it with that name. Okay, and I'll try to put a link in the description of this video as well so that you can just click on that. Okay, so let's go uh, back over to um, the example. We've estimated the transfer function. We've spit out these um, we spit out these 501 frequency. Uh, points or spectrum points, and then we're going to extract the transfer, the impulse response from that. That's a pretty simple process. Again, I showed that in the slide earlier. We flip, we select off, you know, everything but Nyquist and the DC point. We conjugate, and we add that to the positive spectrum components uh, that go from zero to Nyquist, and then we have our full uh, double-sided, you could call it, uh, frequency response or zero to FS or plus or minus FS over two. Uh, we're going to inverse FFT that, then we're going to get our impulse response. For a matter of formality, I took the real part of it, but in general, it will be real at this point. And then that's our impulse response, which we, in this case, we display on an array plot, uh, or it could be on a scope. Okay, you could do either one. I did both here. All right, so that's it. Let's go ahead and run this model and see what happens. Um, 
got my, if you look on the upper right, I have the magnitude response of the system estimated. I've got the phase response estimated lower right. From those two things, I backed out the impulse response on the array plot, which is what you see in the upper left. And of course, that should correspond to some analysis, which I also did out in the MATLAB environment. And I'll show you that how that worked in a little bit. And then there's also the scope version of the impulse response. So in this case, what you see is kind of interesting. You see the evolution of the impulse response. You see the impulse response. That's the first estimate, the second estimate, the third estimate, and the fourth and fifth until it finally averages. And you see it, it comes to uh, a pretty good estimate quickly. You see the at noise kind of average out as it, uh, it you know, as we get more averages. Okay. Uh, and then what I did was in this model, there's a little bit of logging going on. So if we look under the hood again, I logged the complex frequency response or transfer function estimate to the MATLAB workspace. And then I attached to the model a stop function callback. That stop function callback takes that logged complex frequency response. Uh, it takes the very final average, which should be, of course, the best estimate of the frequency response. It does the same thing I did earlier in the MATLAB where I, you know, flipped it, took the conjugate, concatenated it with the positive half, took the inverse FFT, the real part, and that's my impulse response. Then I just plotted that out. And then for a little added benefit, no extra charge here, I converted that impulse response to the pulse response. So that shows you instead of the response to an ideal impulse, which is not really realistic, the system will never see that. It's more of a helpful theoretical concept than it is something you would practically use, uh, you, you would ever see in a real system. Remember, an impulse has an infinitely short duration of infinite amplitude and unit area. So in practice, you know, you can't generate that. In practice, what you can generate is a signal uh, with a particular, uh, a one symbol wide duration. And you, what you want to see is for a one symbol wide pulse into the system, which the system will naturally see all the time, what is the response to that? And for that, it's really a simple integration of the impulse response, okay? And so that's what this function here does. It converts it to an impulse response. And we can see you know, how that works. We open it up, go down to the bottom. We'll see it does subsequent circular shifts of the impulse and adds it uh, and adds them together. And so it's an integration operation. So that is that, and, th and if I run that script again, we'll just run it so you can see it, run it, and we'll see that is the impulse response. And then somewhere along the line, I have an error. So let's see what that error is. Let's go over to MATLAB. I heard something uh, expected in to be, oh, do I not have my OSR computed here? It looks like, oh, my OSR is wrong. It's two point, no, my OSR is 16. I'm not sure how that got set, changed to, uh, I got 16. Now let's run that this section again here. Oh, whoops. Let's just let's just do this as a section. So this is easy. Run that as a section. And here is our pulse response. So impulse response on bottom, pulse response. I'm, I'm sorry. Impulse response on top, pulse response on bottom. And you can see that one is more like an integrated version of the other. Okay, I think that's all I wanted to cover in this video. It's gone on a little longer than I intended. In the next video on this topic, what I plan to show is going back to the slides is we'll go back and we'll show how you could use, do the same thing using a simpler approach using cross correlation, uh, but as we'll see, there's gonna be some downsides to that. So until then, thank you for tuning in.